Shadow. My name is Aaron Rogerson. And I'm Melissa Polizzi. Today we're talking about the Pantheon, not the building, <laughs> but the set of all gods in any individual polytheistic religion, mythology, or tradition. So pan means all, theos means god, so all gods is what pantheon means. Um, examples of a pantheon might be the Sumerian, the Egyptian, the Greek Roman pantheon, the Norse pantheon, the Aztec pantheon, and so on. I think there's many, many more examples we could pull up from every culture. So essentially any historical polytheistic religion has a pantheon. And we often refer to these historical religions as mythologies, mm -hmm. essentially. Maybe not the religion itself, but the, the notion that they have uh, a cast of gods. We refer to that often as a mythology, as in Greek mythology, right? Mm -hmm. So pantheons kind of reflect a cosmology of sorts. It's not just a belief system. It's not just a bunch of stories. It's almost a phenomenological mapping out of the world, or reality or human experience by constructing personified archetypal containers into which we can project unconscious material, have it interact through stories that explain the world, that explain reality, that explain our experience. Mm -hmm. We're kind of getting into this principle of like an archaic uh, philosophy, an archaic science almost of like what how do we make sense of nature? How mm -hmm. do we make sense of the world? Right. What is the meaning of life? How do we explain why the river flows this way? Mm -hmm. How do we explain why the weather changes in these attempts to understand these really grand, numinous, powerful experiences that take us out of subjectivity of ourself and into the principle of the universe? We start to see these developments of these intricate weavings of gods, these something inside of us that connects us to something larger yet uh, also relativizes us, like makes us rec recognize how small we are. Mm -hmm. And within that we can explore what the world is, why we are here, why, why certain phenomena happen the way that they do. And the Pantheon is such an interesting marker of all of these incredibly old cultures. And within them you have these kind of archetypal, uh, tides of similarities that you see between uh, the Norse or the Greek or the Roman and the Aztec. They're all kind of covered with a different facade, but they're mm. all sort of speaking about the same thing. Right. So the notion of religion and the notion of science are kind of blurred over time. Yeah. And we're resistant to that idea, but what early humans were doing with their stories and with their mythology and the deities they came up with, they were really trying to make sense of reality. Mm. It's not just they are, um, you know, the stereotypical scientist who is, uh, you know, going out and picking up things off the ground and being like, what is this? And like running experiments on it. That's a very advanced way of interacting with the world. Mm of trying to figure out what the world is in these very distilled, very precise, very advanced ways. That's how we think of science now. But in the past, kind of this question of what am I? Where did I come from? Where are we going? What is the sky? What is the sun? Mm. Yeah. What is this land we find ourselves? What's beyond the sea? Mm. Like these are big questions that would have confronted the early conscious beings when they start to understand these things of self, mm. of world, they have all these questions that emerge. And so you can understand this, how their attempt to answer these questions um, in a very primitive way would start with stories, explanations. Yes. Yeah. What's the sun? Oh, the sun is a man. It's a being. It's some, some man in the sky who has some kind of power to shine things down on us and things grow in the sun and it's mm -hmm. warm. It's like they're answering questions. Yeah. And over time, 
that advances and advances and advances and it builds upon generations and generations of knowledge. And you get things like alchemy, which, you know, you start to see this combining of phenomenological experience of mm-hmm. like, what am I? Mm-hmm. What is reality yeah. with sort of proto-science? Yeah, it starts yeah. starting to blend and it becomes more and more distilled over time until eventually you have what we think of as being modern science, which is incredibly distilled. Yeah. It's incredibly precise. It's mm-hmm. built upon, again, centuries and centuries of exploration mm-hmm. to get to this point. Yeah. But before that, way back in the past, what we had was a kind of cosmology, a kind of religion, mm-hmm. um, a pantheon reflects this, a way of explaining the world. Yeah. And all of those, as you mentioned earlier, are these like projective containers and we sort of see each of these pantheons as the parts of the inner human experience projected out into the world, out into nature, taking shape as these gods, because it, and then it allows us to have space from these inner dynamics, the kind of questions that have uh, mysteriously sort of, um, I don't know, kind of been out of, just out of grasp of humankind, mm-hmm. yet since the dawn of consciousness, we have desire to answer these big questions. And the pantheon, the gods, the meaning of nature and of life is somehow wrapped up into all of that and allows us to explore these inner contents. It allows us to make sense of the natural world, which is so mysterious in and of itself. Mm. And the pantheon really encapsulates that because especially in the classic religions and the classic cultures, you see an element of all different aspects of nature within the pantheon. You know, Mm -hmm. you don't just have one almighty God that is controlling everything as that sort of became distilled into our more modern religions. No, we have gods that represent the sun and the moon, that represent the hunt, that represent war and Mm -hmm. love and marriage. And all of those are a container of possibility and exploration of that archetypal structure inside of us that we inherently fulfill in our lives. And the question is, why? Why do I feel the sense of falling in love? And why does that person feel it too? And why does that person feel it too? There's a sense of a shared experience. So who's ruling this principle? Well, it must be a God, right? Something larger than me. So the Pantheon really works as this dynamic exploration of all sorts of archetypal uh, structures that we interact with. Right. So um, a good way to illustrate this is to kind of uh, identify these overarching patterns that we see inside Pantheons. There's kind of a universality to Pantheons, Mm -hmm. not exactly, not in an absolute sense. It's not Mm -hmm. as if every Pantheon has the same cast or has the same God that represents the same thing, but you can see that there is sort of a mapping of phenomenological experience through the pantheons. And we can kind of see this by sort of exploring um, the same God across pantheons, Mm. right? Mm -hmm. So the Greek pantheon is probably the most stereotypical (laughs) pantheon, right? Most well-known. I'm assuming that's what most people would think of. Yeah. When they think of sort of like what's the the cast of gods, mm-hmm. I mean the pantheon is Greek, the building, right. the temple of all gods. Um, but the uh, the god on top, or so the god the god at the top of the hierarchy in some mm-hmm. sense, uh, and that's complicated because there's um, there's like the titans and stuff that are yeah. super powerful. But <laughs> Zeus, right? Zeus is sort of um, at the top of the pantheon, mm-hmm. at the top of the Greek pantheon. Yes. And he is, in many ways, this sky father. Yeah. yeah. He's in the clouds. Uh, he is a man. He is a father. He mm-hmm. sires many children. Yeah. He throws the lightning bolts. So there's this kind of like from the heavens type mm-hmm. thing mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. going on with Zeus. Yeah, definitely. Um, the Roman version of that is Jupiter. Yeah, yeah. And really similar to the kind of Greco-Roman um, pantheons really sort of like merged into one another but you once again have that like strong masculine principle Mm. that gets uh, wrapped up into that archetype of jupiter and i think as we start to look at some other pantheons ones that aren't so interwoven it starts to get interesting because you see how multiple archetypal containers can be nestled under one god Mm -hmm. so like if we look at norse mythology as an example you can see some of that principles of the sky god through thor yeah 
even with the lightning um, and, and that being a major symbol. But then you see more of that principle of the like the kind of godhead of the pantheon, that which is kind of the ruling fatherly principle, and that's Odin. Mm -hmm. So Zeus kind of carries some of those principles of Thor and Odin. Um, or with the Egyptian, you might look um, as at Horus, you know, with his uh, with his bird head as that once again capturing the Sky Father and having yeah. sons. So you see that interweaving of that principle of the Father Sky mm -hmm. and how that creates that structure and container of order for each of the pantheons. Right, right. So across the pantheons, we have essentially the same archetype that's manifesting. Yes, yeah, exactly. Because the archetype is universal, right? Mm -hmm. Because the archetypal structure of uh, our psychology is in some yeah. sense a human nature, Yes, right? That's where archetypes yes. are. It's like this is nature. We all possess the archetypes. There's something about um, our evolutionary trajectory through time that has produced this way of framing reality mm -hmm. and one of those frames is the father or yes. the masculine yeah. and for some reason we tend throughout cultures to uh associate that with the sky mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um or the sun mm -hmm. or sort of up out there yeah. as opposed to down here yeah. like um and we covered this in the last two episodes so the, the episode god we did a few months ago Mm -hmm. And the archetype of the mother, which yeah. two episodes ago, and the archetype of the father are all good. Uh, how would you say? Good things to listen to in preparation for this episode. Yes, but off also those our episode on archetypes, which is really, True. really yeah. early on, ultimately yeah, is, is setting that groundwork because to recognize that archetypes are not just these familiar figures that we see like in Harry Potter and mm -hmm. in the Odyssey, that's like become the kind of watered down version of what an archetype is. It is an inherent psychic structure that is part of our human makeup. It is the yeah. same as our biological instincts, but on a psychic level. And there's the, the theory as it's dictated by Carl Jung is that these are inherited structures, mm -hmm. just as we carry the biological instincts of all of the ancestors who came before us. So we also carry an instinctual psychic framework that dictates how certain elements come together that help us frame um, different experiences and situations that give us an instinctual impulse for meaning making and image producing and that is what creates the myths that we know and the stories that we know and the figures of the gods. But behind right. that is something much more mysterious. Right, right. So the archetype is something that we uh, circumambulate, right? Yes, it's, yes. Uh, I think as Kant said, it's something that's on sick, which means the thing in itself of mm -hmm. the archetype, we don't know what it is. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where's the archetype? It's like, mm -hmm. uh, it's, we don't know. Yes. But something is circling it. And these sky gods, for instance, are circling something. They're circling an archetype of some sort. And it probably has something to do with like masculinity and the father and the sky because mm -hmm. they all have those properties. Mm -hmm. But it's not exact. It's sort of this constellation around the archetype. And all mm -hmm. we see are the stars. We don't really see the thing in the center. They're all kind of gravitating around, you might say. Yeah. yeah. So we have Zeus in the Greek pantheon, but then we have like, Odin and Thor mm -hmm. seem to be playing with it. Yeah. There's two of them and it's not exact. And who's, it, who's Thor in the Greek pantheon? It's right. like, oh, Hercules. It's like, not exactly. Like, <laughs> Well, and, and archetypes uh, are a multiplicity of potentialities. Mm -hmm. And de depending on like the kaleidoscopic lens that you look through and what angle, the archetype kind of shifts and changes. Like that is the heart of symbols which are driven by archetypes is that it doesn't have one singular meaning. It doesn't have one singular manifestation. It doesn't have one singular image. It shape shifts. It's incredibly mercurial. And so you see the archetypal structure combining with a uh, collective consciousness culture and dynamics. And then it's producing something like Zeus or it's producing something like Odin and they all have a slightly different flavor, mm. but the core is very, very similar. Yeah. So, uh, the next archetype of the Pantheon is sort of the female mother. Like, yeah, the, ma the sort of like masculine counterpart. Yeah. The, the, the archetypal feminine that is oftentimes the, the wife. Mm. So 
for Zeus, his wife, of course, is Hera, mm -hmm. or we see Juno in the Roman pantheon, yeah. um, or Odin's wife, Frigga, Frigga, mm -hmm. I'm going to pronounce these all wrong, um, or we see like the archetypal mother in Isis in the Egyptian pantheon. So we need both the mother and the father, and yeah. you can always kind of like take a step back as we talked about in the last few episodes, like Hera is the Olympian mother, but mm -hmm. before that we had Gaia. That's like mother earth. She's like the primordial mother yeah. or before Zeus, there was Uranus, like the yeah. actual sky. So there's always like these even deeper, more primordial versions of these archetypes that are at play. Right. More meta versions almost. Yeah. It's like the pattern behind the pattern. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. and there's a pattern behind that. Yes. And so we recognize, um, even with more familiar archetypes that like there's that kind of this notion of like mother earth or Gaia that is like a very sort of overarching feminine notion, yeah. but then like closer to us, sort of closer to consciousness, you might say mm. is sort of like the mother or the queen or the empress mm. or something like that, mm -hmm. which is sort of playing off the same energy, yeah. but it's sort of being more distilled into um, a more conscious figure, I guess you could say. Um, war and chaos, like a god of war. Yeah, these are just we're not going to go through all these, obviously, but just another example of a god of war in Greek. There's Ares. Mm -hmm. uh, the Roman is Mars. Norse has Tyr. Is that how it's pronounced? Maybe. I don't Tyr. Know. That's a pretty cool name. <laughs> uh, Set. Yeah. The Egyptian mythology. Yeah. Set, I thought was interesting. Um, I, I think sometimes people think of a, another Egyptian equivalent as Anhor. I'm mm -hmm. not, probably not pronouncing that right, yeah. but I liked Set as that more principle of like chaotic war. Yeah. Um, because if you connect that really back to that principle of Aries, we get into that archetypal dynamic of like the... Uh, how do you say, like you become totally engrossed by the war energy when Ares is present on the battlefield. Like this isn't just like hand to hand combat or like gentlemen kind of stepping at the field and having a duel. It's, mm. it's bloodlust, it's intensity. It's that part of yourself that feels taken over by something else. Mm. And that's where you start to see those really interesting uh, mythological stories of like, uh, you know, Dionysus came in and put me into a frenzy, yeah. you know, or Cupid came and struck me with his arrow and I fell in love. It's mm -hmm. like, there's something within us that feels like we ego consciousness just goes away. The light turns off and something else takes over. Yeah. And what is it? It's like, it's a God. Mm -hmm. It wasn't me. Something right. more powerful. Right. We're not sure how to explain the, things that seem to control us or the great forces that move us. Mm. And the whole notion of the unconscious is actually a relatively recent idea. Um, you know, within the last 150 years, maybe even more recent than that. But before that, the kind of idea back 2000 years ago, maybe 2,500 years ago, this is sort of the notion of like the bicameral mind by uh, Jared Jaynes is that before, um, before a notion of unconsciousness really came about because of higher consciousness and sort of that sort of recursive understanding of self, everything was explained by gods. Mm, yeah. What is making me do what I'm doing? It's some magical force. And what do we do with things we don't understand? We personify them. Yes. We personify yes. them into deities. We do that with everything. We don't, we don't realize this pattern of anthropomorphizing mm -hmm. the world and taking vague things and wanting to put like a human face on it. But the unconscious of the past, the reasons we fell in love, the reasons we would experience bloodlust, uh, the reasons we would do something that was really stupid. It was like, well, I shouldn't have done that. It's like, what happened? It's like some uh, immortal hand pushed yes. me. Yeah. And so we can see how the, as the, the pantheon represents this early consciousness in mm -hmm. some sense, an yes. early understanding yeah. of the phenomenological patterns or these psychic forces at work, the things that move us, these archetypal patterns, yeah. they're being dramatized, yeah. like not even intellectualized. They're being dramatized right, right. through stories. Yes. And that really helps you stay embodied with it, I believe, right. you know, and maybe in yeah, some ways the, uh, the kind of downside to that is that 
if we aren't able to abstract out of the experience, then we can't bring a higher level of intellect or consciousness to it so that we don't just become victim to our impulses and urges. And maybe that's where we've moved too far in the direction of more modern Western culture is like over intellectualizing it, not being as embodied, Mm -hmm. but that kind of older, more primitive form, it kept us more in that place where we could really fully experience it. And we're not trying to over intellectualize what is happening. We just, we dramatize it and we experience it. Right, right. The mythology is lower down. It's in, it's in the mm. body. And mm. so you, you experience mm. a, a myth, a story, and it activates something within you that right. is below, uh, intellectual, mm. um, uh, interaction, mm-hmm. right? It's yeah. like the body feels that this was a good story. Yeah, you can't just intellectually be like, "These are the reasons it was a good story." Right? Uh, it's it's below that, and so we can see how a story can keep you in the body with a lesson or an idea mm-hmm. or a feeling, whereas an intellectual explanation takes you out of the body, yeah. abstracts you out, and it's not as accessible to us. It's mm-hmm. not, we don't receive it as well. Yeah. It's harder for us to sort of engage with that sort of intellectual explanation mm-hmm. of the world. Mm-hmm. We are much, much more in tune with this sort of personified, felt, embodied mm-hmm. explanation of the world, and that's mythology. Yeah. So falling in love, uh, the beauty of women, sex, it's another huge archetypal uh, tone that we see woven in through the pantheon. So, mm-hmm. of course, with Greek, we've got Aphrodite yeah. or... Uh, Venus, her Roman um, counterpart. In Norse, it's Freya. And Egyptian, we see like Hathor. So we see someone who rules that principle of not necessarily falling in love, although that's sometimes wrapped up to, into mm. this, or you have like Aphrodite, whose son is Cupid, who goes around, you know, shooting everyone with that arrow, making mm. them fall in love. But some driving principle of sexual union of that depth of passion and that which is driving procreation, that must be risen up and put on the pantheon as well. Yeah, well, I mean, sex and love is such a gigantic part of our existence. Yeah. If not in some ways, like the grounding thing of our existence mm. because life reproduces. Yeah. That's what life does is it's sort of self-replicating. So you can, you can understand even more so in the past. Like we, we, we think of sex as being everywhere nowadays, but like it was really... It was really everywhere in the past. I mean, life just revolved around it entirely. Mm-hmm. And um, having some sort of goddess or god of sex and love is just as intuitive as, as, as the, the mother or father, I would yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, another one that we see are these principles of natural phenomena that are brought up into the pantheon. So gods of sea and rivers and water, Poseidon, Neptune, um, with Norse, it's a god named Njord, uh, or in an Egyptian uh, pantheon, it's Sobek. Mm-hmm. So how can we make sense of the natural world? How can we connect to this incredibly powerful, seemingly autonomous element in our lives that brings dis- destruction at yeah. times, that also is life-sustaining or mm-hmm. life-giving, especially with something like with water, so incredibly powerful, yeah. something that can flood the lands, uh, but also, you know, if feeling wrathful might withhold water and cause drought. So like we, we have to understand this. We have to grip with this element of nature. So we must personify it. Right. Water is something that erodes over time, but also something that keeps you alive. So like life and destruction at the same time, creation Mm. and destruction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you can also see how, uh, Again, kind of this blending of what is in some sense physical or material with what is sort of phenomenological or experiential. Yeah. That blend is what's happening early on. And you can you can understand how early humans, they might not perceive much difference between the forces of love and romance mm-hmm. and the forces of the ocean. Yeah. Like they might have an equal representation as far as like a powerful force that moves. Mm-hmm. And so you can see why the fact there's like a God of love and sex is like, and then a God of like water, like that seems kind of strange, like, <laughs> but it's like, no, they're like, they're kind of on a experiential level yeah. to a human who has no scientific background. Yeah. You can see how the natural world and the sort of inner forces that drive you in certain directions, they'd be blended together. Yes. You wouldn't see them as being separate. You'd see them all being interwoven as one thing. And that's what this landscape, the Pantheon is mm. demonstrating. Yeah. 
uh, the underworld, death, the transitions from life into that space of no longer living, of course, a huge part of, of the structure of the Pantheon with Hades and Pluto um, in the Norse Pantheon. It's the goddess Hell in um, the Egyptian Pantheon. We see that kind of blended a bit with Osiris and also Anubis, but this reckoning that there is a principle that takes away life or someone who rules over the underworld. And I think that's always like a really dynamic way of looking at uh, death from this more primitive space because nowadays, you know, I think mm, not necessarily more than not, but certainly a prevailing idea is that when you die, that's it. You're dead. Nothing happens. Mm -hmm. You're just gone, snuffed mm -hmm. out. The candle has been extinguished. Mm -hmm. And instead there's a whole mythology built around what happens when we die or in like the Greek myths, people can come back from the dead or you can go into the underworld and like go find your lover who was killed, you know, in a tragic way and bring her back. Right. There's this whole relationship to death that's explored through the pantheon and not just this kind of finality or even a, a turning away or repressing of the death principle, but rather mm. a curiosity and how my, I, ease into the process of death like the Egyptians did, like God, like just the amount of of uh, ritual that went into the preparation of death or the preparing of the body and how important that was to uh, bringing them into the actual underworld. All of that speaks to this really dynamic relationship to this other aspect of life, the kind of dark half of life. Right. And I mean, we can look at sort of the um, mythology the, the stories uh, around death and they can seem sort of absurd or silly because of what we quote unquote know now, which is that when you die, you die and that's it and your body decomposes and that's it. And that's actually a, a pretty naive way of looking at death, at looking at life. Mm. Um, the sort of materialism, of the idea of nothing transcends you. Mm. Like when you die, that's it. It's, it's huh. a very limited way of looking right. at things because it's not true, actually. The, the the things that you've done in your life, the ways that you've affected people, the kind of patterns that you've manifested, um, the well, way you've touched people, that does yes. transcend you. Yes. And you can see how the stories of the past, this mythology, it is exploring that those mm. ideas. And those ideas are not, uh, they're not wrong. It's right. not superstition to say that like your memory transcends you, your actions transcend you. Yeah. The work of Gandhi or Martin Luther King transcends them. Mm. So that's not, that's not a ridiculous idea. Right. It's true. And you can see how in the past they would be exploring those same notions of how did Martin Luther King's work have an effect on today? Yeah. They would explore that again, not through sort of this literal intellectual uh, explanation, but they would explore it through dramatization, through mm. a story. Mm -hmm. So the notion of people going to the underworld, but still in some sense being alive yeah. <laughs> in the underworld. Or having influence, to, yeah. Right, or being able to go down and bring them back or yeah. them still having some influence on the sort of uh, living world in mm -hmm. some sense. Those stories, they make sense. Yeah. It's, it's, it isn't repressing death. It isn't sort of like, I am so afraid of death that I have to make up some silly story. It's the opposite. It's actually confronting death and saying, what does it really mean? Yeah. What does happen after we die? What What is it about living now that has some sort of relationship to death well, that's important yes. for me to confront? Yes. This is interesting because what you're saying is bringing up a couple of thoughts for me. First and foremost, some of the more modern kind of materialistic thinking, non-mythologically informed to me can create like a, a kind of like nihilistic uh, viewpoint and yeah. attitude towards the world. Mm -hmm. It's just like, whatever, I'm going to die. What's nothing really matters anyways. Right. What does it matter what I accomplish? You know, at some point I'm snuffed out and that creates then this, this really tense relationship to life during this period of years that you're given, that you're mm -hmm. blessed to walk this earth. And then mm -hmm. what do you do with it? Mm -hmm. Because that feeling that nothing really actually matters prevents you from really stepping into that path of individuation and yeah. giving something to the world. On the other side, we look at old stories and often another archetypal theme is that as you enter into the underworld, there's a judgment, you know, you're uh, weighed against um, a, a feather as you move in through the Egyptian pantheon, you know, and Anubis is taking you deeper and deeper. And it's mm -hmm. like, have you been uh, not necessarily good enough, but, you know, you're going to be measured against a principle of, of justice. 
uh, of some sort of moral, rational, rationalized moral structure of that culture that says, you've done well, now you may pass through, Mm -hmm. you know? And so there's this idea that the life that you're living now, the choices that you're making will Mm -hmm. have an impact and you should consider that those things take you deeper into being accepted into heaven, you know, yeah. or going to the right places in mm. in the afterlife. And you see that from everything from the Egyptian pantheon to like Christian um, stories as well. Yeah. So, and what does that teach us on a deeper psychological level? It's like our lives matter. How we choose to live matters. Mm. The, the, what we hold ourselves up to matters. We affect not just ourselves, but others. And we continue to live on in some way, our impact, our influence and if you're going to be judged upon death in some way, it's not to feel limited or oppressed by some sort of moral structure, but rather to live up to some greater potentiality. Right. To give your life meaning. Yeah. And this this brings up uh, the next point I was going to make. We didn't really talk about this much beforehand, but mm. um, the the pantheon is not just these beings and that's mm. it. It's like yeah. you have a cast of characters and that's it. It's like, no, it's the cast of characters, but they're all interacting with one another. Yes. So it's true. not just these archetypal containers mm-hmm. as in the being, the the sky god. Yeah. It's the interaction between all of them, true. right? And so uh, one way of explaining the world, one way of explaining sort of what has happened, how we got here, who are we, is through the stories of these beings. Yeah. And so in some sense, the notion that after you die, there's a mythology that you are judged by some being of did you do good or did you do bad? And then you have to pass a test of some kind to get somewhere that's like a good place to be or a bad place to be. You can see how that also is an archetypal story. Yeah, It's not just an archetypal being. It's sort of an archetypal pattern um, that we might see manifest uh, universally through these cultures or through these pantheons. And so I kind of wonder, we didn't do the research for this prior, but um, are there recurring stories in the pantheons that we see that like overlap? Mm. There's uh, Osiris and yeah. Isis and Horus right. and Set, yes, right? Definitely. And Set, uh, what does he do? He murders Osiris, cuts him up and mm-hmm. throws him throughout the yeah. throughout the world. Yeah, and some people compare that to the dismemberment of, of Dionysus. Yeah. And how that like relates to this regenerative principle mm-hmm. or even to the, um, you know, not like Jesus gets dismembered, but, you know, they also connect that to the the redemptive quality of his death and resurrection and moving through this life death cycle. And what does that represent? Right. Well, with Dionysus, it's like he's uh, the grape plant. He's the harvest. Mm-hmm. You know, how do we see these life cycles happening? How do we recognize this kind of natural cycle that is born again and withers and dies. Mm -hmm. And so you see these archetypal stories woven through different cultural structures that are speaking to greater inherent truths. And sometimes they're colored a little bit differently. You might have to dig a little bit deeper to really see it. But like, absolutely, do you see, you know, like a destructive consuming mother, you know, or the loving wife who's like going on like this grand journey to bring back like, some aspect of the masculine. Right. Right. There's, um, Odin Mm. is a traveling old man. He kind of has a disguise, but Mm. there's, um, at some point where he sacrifices his eye. Yeah. Right. Hangs upside down from the world tree to gain knowledge. Right. And the runes. Right. And there's sort of like that archetypal story of sacrificing something in order to gain wisdom. Or even losing the eye uh, is partly the, the story of Horus as well, isn't mm-hmm. it? Mm-hmm. Maybe I'm basing this off of the Gods of Egypt movie because <laughs> I don't actually know the Egyptian <laughs> mythology that well. But we're like uh, Horus uh, as a hero, as a sort of uh, the Logos figure mm-hmm. or like the one who mediates between chaos and order. Yes. It's up to Horus to uh, figure out, I was going to say pick up the pieces. Yes. That'd be kind of a, a pun almost on Osiris being chopped up. But uh, <laughs> No, Osiris, it's part of it. It's yeah. part of it because like Isis grabs, she, she goes out and grabs the yeah. pieces. She goes out and she seeks the pieces, but it's part of the the new kind of archetypal energy of the sun, yeah. a.k.a. Horus, mm-hmm. S-O-N, I mean, mm-hmm. that that comes to completion. He's, right. He plays a really important role in that. Mm-hmm. So these, these stories... Um, so it takes so much 
academic work to actually map this all out. I'm sure there's like oh, some good books yeah. about the the pantheon through cultures mm. um, mm-hmm. and exploring the stories of the pantheons. But you do see sort of like the hero. Yeah. Right? The hero's I mean, journey we, is universal. We did the flood episode and right. I think that's a really good example. If mm-hmm. you really want a good like comparative mythology example, yeah. listen to that episode because we map that archetypal story of the flood through uh, the Mesopotamian arc, through mm-hmm. the Greek arc, through the Christian arc. Yeah. And these are all so different. And yet there are very, very particular, very similar patterns that we see, yeah. you know, that the land needs to be flooded by a big God, that mm-hmm. there is some sort of flood hero that brings through that redemption or carries like the life force through, that there's a, some sacrificial elements, that there's usually a recreating of mankind. Yeah. And you see that in in cultures that span such different times and space from one another. Right. So it's not just deities that we're talking about spanning across these pantheons. It's also stories. Yeah. It's also like these... Um, how would, you, how would you even say like these little, I mean, they're archetypes essentially, mm-hmm, but yes. I want to say like they're like memes or little scenes. Right. Like the no, flood yeah, is like archetypes. this strange yeah. archetype. It's important to recognize that the archetypal structure doesn't just give way to the figure of, you know, love and sex or yeah. to the sky God yeah. or to the underworld. It yeah. also gives rise to these story-like motifs, like the hero's Motif. journey. There you go. That was the... Word I was <laughs> and that is as inherently archetypal and mysterious as the the containers of of the figures that we consider to be, you know, the, the archetypal containers. Right. So, as humans progressed through history, this sort of pattern of creating a cosmology, uh, a cast of characters, you can say, that sort of explain the world and explain the patterns, explain the seasons, explain these sort of ups and downs, the vicissitudes of life. Mm. It does morph over time. The culture builds and builds on itself and it becomes more and more refined in some sense. It evolves. It can get sort of distilled. Uh, it's not always a good thing, I would say, <laughs> this this pattern, but like there is an evolution of the pantheon over time mm. uh, where it becomes something new that hasn't existed in the past. And one of those examples would be, and we've talked about this before, but sort of the shift from polytheism to monotheism, mm. for instance, has its own shift from a pantheon to kind of a new sort of pantheon that's not exactly <laughs> the same as the previous one. It's like an implicit pantheon. Yeah. Because even if we consider like the development of like the Abrahamic religions and the rise of Christianity, it's like, oh, it's not really a pantheon anymore. It's like, hmm. You start to look at the figures Mm -hmm. of God, the father of the Holy spirit Mm -hmm. of Jesus, of the Virgin Mary, of Mary Magdalene, of the saints. They're all carrying these archetypal energies with Mm -hmm. them. They're all different. And yet there's been a new evolution. As you said, there's been a distillation. There's been like this new leveling up of conscious understanding of what I would call like the Jungian self archetype, which is more of a principle of wholeness, more singularly held within a, 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 core one archetype but then that single archetype is made up of the most multiplicity so it's almost as we orient to that principle of self towards that divine principle of Mm -hmm. wholeness and ordering that first we see the multiplicity and then it evolves and it becomes more distilled into something more singularly powerful yet is still supported by those kind of sub archetypes Right, so God the Father or the one God in some sense is Mm -hmm. um, a deity, is a being that maybe would have manifested in a pantheon but has been raised up to an even higher, even more uh, meta place, a more untouchable place, Mm -hmm. a more sort of all-encompassing sort of the Jungian self as the one God is the container almost of all things. Yeah. And as you said, it's that can be sort of broken down into a multiplicity, uh, which can be broken down into even further multiplicities. You can get more and more complex manifestations of this archetypal energy into lower and lower beings, you mm-hmm. might say, that are sort of uh, trickling down from the, the highest uh, one God yeah. principle. And so... Um, the Virgin Mary, for instance, uh, 
in our modern world even plays a huge archetypal role, which yes. is, is essentially uh, that of a goddess. Yeah. Um, she uh, represents sort of uh, compassion mm-hmm. and purity mm-hmm. and comfort and um, sort of the divine mother, yeah. uh, the energy that you can rely on to be there to take care of you, this sort of unconditional, uh, never-ending love that is free to you if you want it. And you can understand how that doesn't sound like maybe it would be that different from a goddess of right. love right. or sex or yeah. uh, of the mother yeah. that might have been present in a more ancient pantheon. Yes, yeah. Because you can see within Mary, Isis, you can see within her Demeter, you know, we don't necessarily approach the Virgin Mary as a goddess figure, but actually in many ways she's manifested, ritualized in, in that way. And I, and I think oh, that's part of the kind of interesting commentary against Christianity, especially from a Jungian perspective, is like where's the divine feminine, mm-hmm. sometimes seen as the missing fourth of the, the Trinity or what would turn the Trinity into a mm. quaternity, okay. which is more of that symbol of wholeness that the Jungians love. It's like where's the feminine, where's the mother? And that could be really looked upon as the Virgin Mary and lifted up into that divine goddess um, space but you know people still worship her like she's a god Mm -hmm. they still wear amulets of the virgin mary around their neck or have a statue of her on um, an altar space Mm -hmm. we do worship her like she's a goddess but we don't necessarily see a christian pantheon at least explicitly right but it's there yeah Yeah, like the the saints yeah the Um, saints there's stories of these saints Mm -hmm. and some of these stories i think are clearly mythological embellishments um they're probably all grounded in truth. I don't think they're just sort of like complete uh, archetypal projections. Sure, Um, sure, yes. uh, And I don't know enough about this, but like there's uh, saints, for instance, that uh, refused to uh, disavow Christianity Mm -hmm. or refused Mm -hmm. to convert and Mm -hmm. instead chose to be shot by arrows and somehow survived being shot by like 20 arrows. And that's like the story of that saint. And it's like this amazing powerful myth yeah um that is sort of taken as being what actually happened yes it's probably grounded in truth but you can right. see again that like it's not just these beings the saints in some sense represent beings mm. they're not really gods it's not like you yeah, know this saint different. is like oh it's the god of thunder it's like well it's, it's a little <laughs> it's a little more grounded than that it's yeah. a, little more, a little more down to earth than that but still these stories do um evoke this archetypal energy these patterns uh, these phenomenological uh, frameworks by which we sort of interact with reality are uh, projected through these stories, these saints. It's important to also ask the question of why something that has like actual historical roots was mythologized because mm-hmm. there's something really potent there. Yeah. There's like a merging point of an actual uh, real grounded concrete event that also kind of created like a doorway into the collective unconscious right. and then from there like you grip into it and what do you pull forth depths of archetypal information and material mm-hmm. that gets wrapped up into a real life story and then raised up to this like powerful space where we then maybe worship that saint on a holy day yeah. where they represent like you know the patron saint of this or that it's like they've become a kind of mythological figure mm-hmm. based in some sort of reality, yeah. but it's carrying with it the the collective unconscious archetypes. Right. So fast forward through history even further, and you begin to see pantheons emerging that, again, do not really have the same quality as pantheons mm-hmm. of uh, ancient Greece, for instance, sure. and... Uh, not in any particular order, let's say, but like the uh, Marvel and DC universe. Yeah. What is that? Like what's going on there? <laughs> Those are, yeah, it's, it's sometimes like literal pantheon figures. <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes it is because like there's like, like Thor. Thor yeah. yeah. All this like Norse mythology that's yeah. being woven in or frankly, like I feel like a lot of modern comics are just modernizing these old mythologies right. and giving us an ability to understand these archetypal structures with a modern um, mask on it, yeah. which makes it approachable. Right, right. And so the Marvel and DC comics, they're, they're about superhumans. Yeah. But the superhumans are fighting. Mm. And mm-hmm. 
what makes them superhuman. It's like they're sort of beings, but they have these special powers. They're mm. stronger. They live in more fantastical places. Yeah. They have more fantastical problems, <laughs> like having to right. save the world constantly. Right. So the Marvel and DC universe, and this is, you know, illustrated pretty, I wouldn't say literally, uh, pretty, uh, it's pretty distilled in like the recent Marvel Cinematic Universe movies. Mm. It's like, what do you have? It's like, you essentially have a bunch of gods fighting. Yeah. What is Thanos? Right. He's a god. Right. Who's he fighting? Yeah. He's fighting these other gods. Yeah. Iron Man is a human, but like he has these crazy superpowers. He can fly. He can mm. shoot rockets. He's essentially a god. And so, again, you have this sort of archetypal uh, projections yes. happening yeah. where Iron Man fulfills some sort of framework. He's not necessarily the Sky Father, but he's something that's a little more distilled, a little more refined, a little more, how would you say, down to earth than sort of like the one father, which is sort of like this meta archetype. It's an archetype that's a little more broken down mm. into finer pieces. And the cast of the Avengers, for instance, they all have this archetypal expression yeah. that when combined is compelling. Yes. And so it's yes. almost like the human experience or a like human personality is being mapped through these characters. Yes. Mm -hmm. You also see that interesting dynamic that it's never just the gods fighting and we're just kind of watching. We're impacted by the gods. We're impacted by their fighting or sometimes we're on the same battlefield. So in the Avengers movies, it's like, yes, there's like Thor and Loki and um, I don't know, Captain America, does he count? He's like superhuman. Yep. Anyways, but then you also have like these kind of human, like you have, what's the, the bow and arrow guy? Hawkeye, okay. and then there's the Black Widow, mm -hmm. right? there. Those are actually like humans. Yeah. So you have this mix of the human kind of ego consciousness interacting with that archetypal power. It's like, what was the Iliad? It's like, oh, here we see gods and, and, and humans and soldiers fighting on the same battlefield because within us, within our own internal structure is the power of the gods, the right. archetypal structures, and also the limited human consciousness. This is just a new modern manifestation of that. Right, but it gets kind of weird. It gets sort of implicit because I would say even Hawkeye and the Black Widow are gods. Hmm. Are these normal humans? Sure. It's but like, no, what is it? it's an archer true. that can fight with space aliens. <laughs> like, is that a normal human? Do well, you know someone like Hawkeye? Yes. The Black Widow, she has like crazy kung fu powers <laughs> and she's hot <laughs> and she can just like beat up like Thor or something right. like somehow. And it's like, is she human? It's okay. like, no, she's actually also a god. Hmm, fair and then point. If you think about something like Lord of the Rings, it's like Lord of the Rings is a pantheon. Hmm. It's like you have more god like figures like Sauron. But Aragorn is like a uh, quote unquote human sort of, but he's also like not really human. No, he's got some like weird like elvish blood in him. Well, there's there's that, but <laughs> but even even Boromir, I would say, right. is a god. Yeah, these that's fair. these stories we're telling, these mythologies we're telling, it's not normal humans. Yeah, we don't look at Boromir and say like, oh, that's me. Yeah, it's like I do that. <laughs> Like I've venture into Mordor occasionally <laughs> like when I go to the grocery store. It's like, no, no, no. It's like th this is this is depicting a world of superhuman powers, mm. fantastical environments. It's the mythological world and it's everything that's sort of been boosted up in this way True. into God world, True. into God form. But in some ways, Boromir, he's embodying more of that human warrior archetype, mm. which you might say like a modern version of that is like someone who enters into the military and trains and fights on the battlefield and is like more skilled than the average person. They've Their skill set has been like heightened due to like intense training or like walking that archetypal path. And there is more of a sense that I can relate to Boromir versus relating even to Aragorn, who does have some of that elvish blood. He's a little bit more magical. And mm -hmm. then take another step further is like Legolas. It's like, okay, like an elf is totally unrelatable. They've got no, this no, crazy, yeah, they can see really, really far. Like they me. can like speak to nature. <laughs> like me. <laughs> right, exactly. So I, I, I don't disagree with your point, but my pushback is that I do think there are these some human warrior archetypes that are still a little bit more grounded in the limitations of the human principle. And that is meaningful. That's they're fighting alongside the kind of demigods and also the actual gods. Right. Right. Okay. So to, to prove my point even further, okay. the probably most prominent pantheon nowadays are celebrities. Ooh, okay. 
All and right. so what's happening there, I would say, I would argue mm. that celebrities are a mythology. Yeah. We don't like true. the real celebrity. <laughs> we like the story of them. Yes. We like the myth of yeah. the celebrity. And so Chris Hemsworth, mm. who is he? I would say he's a god. Right. I don't know him personally. All I know is sort of the myth of Chris Hemsworth. And what's his myth? It's like he has a hammer and he can fly. It's like, well, but that's Thor. It's like, yeah, but Chris Hemsworth is Thor. Right. When he gets off the screen, do I know the difference? Mm. I don't really know the difference. Yes. And so celebrities represent a pantheon to us. Yes. We fuss yeah. over them. Mm. We're interested in their story and their struggles. Mm. They interact with each other and we're like, what's happening? And we want, we want to know. And we'll buy magazines about it. <laughs> yeah. And it's almost like we are craving this mythology. Mm. Who are the people that we can lift up to God form? Yes. Yes. We do that with celebrities. Yes. Even yeah. though they are quote unquote humans. Yeah. We don't really uh, we don't really perceive them as humans. We perceive them as superhumans. Yeah, I agree. That's a great point and it shows that there is this impulse and need to explore the archetypal structure and when we deny it because we've extinguished religion, because we've extinguished mythology, we've extinguished the dramatization of our inner contents, we're going to project it somewhere. Yeah. And where's it going to go? Mm -hmm. It's going to go on like regular people who then really struggle to hold that archetypal projection. Yeah. How difficult is it to carry the weight of a God upon your shoulders? Mm -hmm. I think celebrities feel that. I think that's why they burn out so quickly. Yeah. Sometimes literally in death mm -hmm. or in some sort of really um, violent way of, of dealing with life. Um, to carry that archetypal energy is something that humans are not meant to do. We must create the deities and and the pantheon gods to place them upon because right. those are hooks that ultimately they can carry we as humans really cannot right right so uh, like another interesting way to illustrate this is like a, a band for instance mm. a famous band is a pantheon yeah they're gods the <laughs> yeah. beatles the rolling stones they're gods we don't sure. really think of them as being human yeah we might acknowledge like consciously well yeah i know i know that Mick Jagger's a human. Mm. It's like, yeah, but you don't treat him like one. Yeah. If you saw him walk down the street, you wouldn't be like, oh, there goes a human. You'd be like, oh, there's a fucking God. Like, oh yeah. my God, it's Mick Jagger. Oh my God. Like yeah. he has superpowers. Um, and we can see that the band works. Usually a, a band that is popular, people fuss about, mm. has a cast of characters, right? Mm. The five guys in the band, for yeah. instance, they represent archetypal containers that we yes. project onto. Yes. The bassist is like this archetypal container right. and the drummer and they have right. different personalities. And when their personalities sort of map out different parts of our experience, mm. we like it. Mm -hmm. Whereas if they don't really work together very well or yes. they don't fill these, uh, these archetypal containers, we don't really like the band as much. It's not as compelling. Yes. That's a good point. It's almost making me think of like the marketing strategy of like coming up with a band mythology as right, right. you boy rise. Bands. Yes. Boy bands yeah. or even like the Spice Girls. It's like they already all were archetypes and they dressed as their archetypal figures. Right. And it's like, I, I like that one because yeah. I relate to being sporty or mm. scary or kind of sweet. And right. They're <laughs> doing it very, very intentionally. Yes. Like, yes. Who's yes. she? It's like, she's the scary archetype. Right. We're literally saying so. Yeah. And she's the sporty <laughs> archetype. And we really want you to recognize how they have these different identities, yeah. but they're interacting with each other. But I think even you and I, since we're on the music, like, yeah. you know, tilt now, can recognize that as artists, you almost start to naturally have this impulse to create a band mythology. Mm -hmm. And I think we've both been in bands where like we've created like a mythos around the band itself. Yeah. And there are people in the band that each are carrying like a different identity. Right. And, and that actually makes it more fun. And I feel like compared to the different bands that I've been in, the one that did that the best got the best reaction from the crowd. Yeah. The other bands where it's like, I didn't necessarily have much of an identity, especially one that people could grasp onto just from watching us in a show. It's yeah. like, eh, not as compelling, not as interesting. But the band that has a mythos with each of those band members kind of carrying like a different identity, that's compelling. Right. So we've gone from ancient Greece pantheon <laughs> to Alyssa and I are gods. So that's, that was the, uh, the train of thought there. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, the, this, this sort of synthesis of phenomena is kind of like what we're trying to get at, right. right? Is the band a pantheon? Not really, but you can see the connection, right? Yeah. And if you can understand the draw of a famous band or you can understand the draw of a 
celebrity feud mm-hmm. or you can understand the draw of a show like Game of Thrones, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Game of Thrones is a pantheon. Yeah. Jon Snow is quote unquote human. Yes. But he's a god. Yeah. He's like Thor. He's like Horus. He's the mm, hero. Yeah. He's fighting good and evil. Mm-hmm. He's on these crazy adventures that we'll never experience in our life. <laughs> and yet it's it's we're projecting onto it something that's very powerful and compelling to us. Yeah. And so you can see the link back to the cast of gods, the set of gods for any given religion, any given polytheistic religion, and sort of the our our interaction with reality in modern day. Mm. So today's exploration into all these deep mythological themes is in preparation for our next and final guest of this round of the Shadow Play Speaker Series, Michael Mead. He's the host of the Living Myth Podcast. He's a renowned storyteller, author, and scholar of mythology, and he'll be joining us at the Stoa to discuss initiation and ritual and how the shadow is represented in mythology. So if you're interested in attending this free event, go to the stoa.ca and RSVP. If you find this podcast useful, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash golden shadow org. If you'd like to keep up to date with our projects, attend one of our live events, or work one-on-one with myself or Aaron, head to www.goldenshadow.org. Thanks for listening. See you later.